Watch this. Was to protect health information, but you have to balance that against the need of law enforcement to enforce crimes. You asked, how does HIPAA protect Idahoans from being investigated if they get an abortion now that there's about to be a new ban? Well, it's not that simple. It does, but it doesn't. The city of Mountain Home is getting a fresh coat of paint. Well, more than one coat and in many colors. The town the kids call Moho may soon be known as the mural capital of Idaho. Humphrey the Hawk has been an icon at Memorial Stadium since it opened 33 years ago. That same season, he made a name for himself outside Boise because of what he did on the field. Well, what everyone thought was him at the time. We've been hearing this a lot lately, well, at least since last week. The theme around the conversation of Idaho's new abortion law seems to be, I don't know, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. It's an answer we continue to get on a variety of questions, and we ask a variety of people who are supposed to know how Idaho's new laws will work. And sure, there is some time to figure it all out, but still, there are and might be a lot of unanswered questions. And we see those questions every day, like this one. Linda wrote us and said, does HIPAA provide any support for privacy against the new abortion laws, especially allowing family members to sue a provider? Well, Linda hasn't been the only one to ask this question, if HIPAA protections could prevent investigations into illegal abortions. In Idaho, when that law goes into effect later this summer, there might be some new rules in play. HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, does protect the release of medical information. But how far does that go? Is this something that could really complicate Idaho's new law? Joe Paris spoke with a Boise expert on HIPAA and how it could interact with the state's new abortion law. When Idaho's abortion laws change later this summer, sensitive medical information will be at the center of the conversation. Idaho's law will outlaw almost all abortions, creating a situation where there could be investigations into possible illegal abortions. There are questions. How will that look? Investigating private medical information, like the circumstances around an abortion, can be sensitive and difficult. Some are asking if Idahoans can cite HIPAA protections to avoid investigations if they find themselves in that situation. HIPAA does not apply directly to the patient. HIPAA only applies to health care providers who engage in certain electronic transactions and health plans, including employer benefit health plans. So the patient can't necessarily hide behind HIPAA because HIPAA doesn't cover them, doesn't apply to them. Kim Stanger is a partner at Holland and Hart Law Firm, where he's the head of the health law group. He explains, HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, it doesn't apply to individuals. It covers health care providers and how they need to protect patient health info. The provider and the health plan and their business associates would be prevented from disclosing any protected health information unless they fit within a HIPAA exception. And there's different HIPAA exceptions that may or may not apply depending on the circumstances. So, as Stanger explains, HIPAA does prevent the release of medical records, but... HIPAA only goes so far. It's not an absolute block in all cases. Certainly, if the police or law enforcement or investigator, if they go to court and get a warrant or a subpoena, then HIPAA would allow the disclosure or compliance consistent with the court order or warrant. Although for subpoenas, there's some additional steps that the law enforcement would have to jump through before they could access the information. If there was a situation where a doctor was brought into court in a suspected case of illegal abortion and no subpoena or anything of that matter has been made to access medical records, that doctor can only say so much. HIPAA protects patients if no exception has been made, like a court order. Not only may they do it, but they, they would have to do it under HIPAA. HIPAA would prevent them from disclosing the information unless a HIPAA exception applies. But it's not too hard to satisfy one of those HIPAA exceptions if the law enforcement goes and gets a court order or a warrant that requires that uh, physician to go ahead and make the disclosure. It's important to note, HIPAA was not designed to be used as a way to dodge investigations. Rather, it's simply to protect information. It was to protect health information, but you have to balance that against the need of law enforcement to enforce crimes, to enforce the, the existing laws. And so HIPAA tries to balance that by creating um, certain exceptions that would allow the, the law enforcement to access information without court involvement. But aside from those, it always leaves open the option for the court to go or for a law enforcement to go get a court order or warrant, just like they would in any other criminal investigation. So to summarize, yes, HIPAA prevents healthcare providers from releasing information, but there are clearly defined limits and exceptions. When it comes to law enforcement, uh, 
Law enforcement officers can get around HIPAA by getting a warrant or a court order or fitting in with one or the other ex exceptions. So they can't, uh, they can't cite HIPAA just to ignore a court order or a warrant. So as we've highlighted in this discussion, uh, really since last Friday, there's a lot of unknowns, but we do have the answer now for the HIPAA situation. But we see all your questions every evening here on the 208, and a lot of them we are putting into our file to get them answered. When we talk to experts in the legal and the medical and even the judicial field right now, a lot of them say there needs to be conversations over the next 30 to 60 days to really get all this flattened out. And Brian, uh, something that we heard from Mr. Stanger there is they're also looking for some guidance from the Idaho Attorney General's office on how specifically to maybe take a look at some of this in court or take a look at how this could be investigated. All of this is, of course, complicated by the fact that there's another state law, the civil enforcement mechanism that we've talked about allowing family members to be sued. That's still caught up in the Idaho mm -hmm. Supreme Court. So whether that gets decided soon or not, we'll find out. But the whole thing is it's very complicated. Yeah, and thank you again for your question. You mentioned the Idaho Attorney General's Office. They've been busy and will continue to be busy over the next couple of days. In fact, the Attorney General's Office pushing back a bit on Planned Parenthood's second lawsuit, which was filed this week. And again, this is all related to this abortion ban that goes in play probably at the end of the summer. The lawsuit that, the, uh, that was filed, I should say, is the one the agency hopes will stop Idaho's trigger law abortion ban. That lawsuit filed Monday. And in it, Planned Parenthood asked for an expedited hearing. They wanted this soon, or heard sooner rather than later, since the law is set to go live 30 days after the Supreme Court issues its final judgment, which is supposed to happen sometime in August. Go into effect, that is. The judgment could come at the end of July. But the Attorney General's office says, why expedite when that countdown clock hasn't even started yet? And the fact the Supreme Court hasn't yet issued a final judgment. The part that caught our attention, though, was the part of the AG's response, which basically said, why are you asking us anyway? The remedy, they said, sought by petitioners should be sought in the legislature or the ballot box. They do say that if the court, if the court does decide to hear this case early, it would, would like to be uh, in late July, likely be in late July or August 3rd, which is also the same day Planned Parenthood's first lawsuit is expected to be heard in Idaho's Supreme Court. So there's a lot of elements, kind of wheels turning, cogs moving for this whole thing to go into play before we get through the end of the summer. The Attorney General's office adds they want each of these lawsuits heard separately as they present different legal issues. All right, as we were going through our inbox, we found another question from uh, Al about renovations happening at Ann Morrison Park. Question was, do you know when the fountain in Ann Morrison Park is going to be up and running? We drive by it and it's fenced off, but didn't see anyone really working on it. Yeah, it's been a common sight for a lot of people in downtown Boise. On a day like today, the fountain would be nice next several days to have around, help cool people off, right? It's actually been around since the 1950s, that fountain, but quite frankly has outlived its life expectancy, we're told, and hasn't been turned on since at least last summer. With electrical issues and cracks in the foundation, it was time to, well, get a new one. So earlier this spring, crews started the process of demolishing the old one. This is kind of what it looks like today. Yep, behind that fence, like Al said. You can see it's still a bit of a mess, but this is what it will eventually look like. A 70-foot long ground-level interactive water tunnel that is interactive for everyone of all ages and abilities. It's going to also include an interactive element that with the process of a button, we just got to push this button, water jets are going to run through a water show sequence, which should be pretty cool to see. There will also be curved benches on both ends. You can see one there where people can sit get their feet wet maybe, total cost to repair, replace this fountain, expected to be around $2 million. City of Boise says it was hoping to have it open by the 4th of July, which means this weekend, but like everything else, supply shortages have gotten in the way. Employee shortages also, and of course those shipping delays that have pushed that date back. They now say they hope to have it open by the end of the summer. Public art probably isn't the first thing that comes to mind when we mention Mountain Home, but local artists are hoping to change that, and they're making a pretty big impression on the landscape. Let's hear your impressions with the show and anything we've talked about today. And in case you need a reminder, here's our number, 208-321-5614. Call or text us anytime. Just be sure to include your name in the hashtag, the 208. Comments, complaints, questions, story ideas, we want to see them all. And we may let everyone else see yours at the end of the show.
You know, the city may not be known as a hotbed for public art, but it's hard to miss the transformation that's been happening in Mountain Home. For the last seven years, local artists have been working on what they're calling a community canvas, basically making a canvas out of the entire community. And it's a collection of more than 160 murals throughout the city. In just the last month, they've added another 20. Photojournalist Kevin Esslinger spent a few hours in Mountain Home one night last week and talked with four of those artists to get a better sense of what this makeover means for Mountain Home. You're not getting paid to do it, so you're doing it just to do it. And you're doing it for the fact of like just sharing your artwork. It's nice because it's such a small town, people would never think that we would have this many murals everywhere. I've never done anything like this. I usually do watercolor, um, but this is one that I uh, decided this was my year and I wanted to do something new. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. My name is Amanda Rose, and this is called Draw the Stars. It's a 1,200 square feet. It's about 20 feet tall and 60 feet wide. It's the biggest mural of the season. No, actually, I was so excited. But I was like, let's start now. But I had to wait <laughs> until it was time to start. So no, I really enjoy all of it. This is day five, and I work full time. So I just come in after work and just get it done. I just come in whenever I have time, like before work, usually in the mornings. I'm Kiana Grover. It's supposed to be an eye, and then there's gonna be a hand reaching out, and there'll be a jar that it's holding, and then there'll be like smoke and stuff coming out of the jar. I did it largely based on the wall. I chose the eye based on the fact that the window was right here. I think it's awesome that everybody's like, making Mountain Home prettier. And I think it's a lot of fun to do, and I think it really improves the town. I just like the idea of leaving my art somewhere public, you know? And it's just a learning experience, too. And I just like painting, so it's a win-win. <laughs> I really like using these type of colors. I've been recently experimenting with, like, different types of colors like this so I can study like shadows and lights better. Well, my name is Zoe Burbank and um, my mural is here to represent any of our best friends or pets who've passed away and they're here as a remembrance so that we still love them in, their, in our hearts forever. Because I recently lost two pets and I was originally going to do it as a tribute towards them specifically, but I changed the colors and on these two pets to be more neutral and just plain so that anyone could picture their pets there and this will be like a memorial towards them. I think my least favorite part about painting on the wall is all the little holes that you have to fill in. It kind of destroys your brush in the process. But it looks so pretty once you're done doing it. Oh yeah, I love it so far. All my paintings right now, you kind of have to really stop and stare in order to figure out what's going on because there's so many different things happening. My name is Brianna Strom and for this mural, it was a tribute for Salvador Dali. I think the hardest part with painting murals is filling in all of the cracks of the wall. <laughs> it's like painstaking. And then you think you're done and you're not done. This one's really clunky. Probably the clunkiest paint I've ever seen. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like some sludge. It adds a good texture. Gotta live by Bob Ross sometimes, even when you're painting Salvador Dali. <laughs> It'll look good, just trust the process. <laughs> but I think murals is my favorite, just because it's so large scale. Community Canvas is such a great organization too, to be able to put art all over and be part of Idaho's mural capital. It's been a very empowering experience. So I look forward to doing more things with them. And I would, will definitely be doing it again. That is one way to beautify a cinder block wall, isn't it? If you're interested in checking out those murals, those new murals, or even the old ones, they're going to be officially unveiled on the 4th of July. Volunteers will be passing out updated maps 
from about 9 a.m. until noon, where you can check out all 180 of those murals. That's going to make for a, a few steps. You'll get your steps in that day for sure. A long time ago, this Boise Hawks manager was ejected from a game, but found a secretive way to sneak back in. How did he get caught? It's got to be the shoes. All right, time to share your thoughts on 208. Join the 208 conversation with a text message, 208-321-5614. You know, that number also works if you're better with words over voicemail. Just be sure to always include your name and the hashtag the 208 with any text message. Today is a momentous day in Boise Hawks history. In fact, it's a momentous day in minor league baseball history because on this day, June 29th in 1989, 33 years ago, Boise Hawks baseball manager Mal Fitchman was ejected during a game but returned to the field disguised as Humphrey the Hawk, the team mascot. Mal was suspended one game for the stunt. 33 years ago, the Boise Hawks were in the opening month of their third season. An unaffiliated team playing in the eight-team Northwest League. In fact, Memorial Stadium was brand new. It was only like two weeks into their opening of Memorial Stadium back then. Their manager was Mal Fitchman. The 5'6", 155-pound baseball lifer from back east. He was also the executive vice president, as you can see it says there on his baseball card from the season before. That would be 1988. So 33 years ago, today, the Salem Dodgers out of Oregon were in town. And it was the bottom of the sixth inning, Hawks trailing, Paul Clough, second baseman from BYU, was at bat. Clough make con makes contact. It's a ground ball in the infield. There's a close play at first, and he's called out. Well, Clough didn't concur. Said something about the diminutive stature of the first base umpire, and then he was 
subsequently tossed. Coaching third at the time was Fitchman, who didn't realize Clough was sent to the showers until he got back to the dugout. So the story goes, Fitchman argued with the umpire. He agreed with Clough's assessment that if the ump was more than five feet tall, he might have had a better look at the play. So Fitchman was also ejected. But Fitchman wasn't going to let that stop him. It just so happened it was a hot day and temperatures were still in the 90s that evening. And guy who was working as Humphrey the Hawk that night, his name was Jason, I believe. He was taking a break, cooling his heels and pretty much everything else under the uh, stands. Hawk set, Hawk, that head that he wears, the big old head, yeah, was set on the ground next to him. And according to the story, Fitchman told Minor League Baseball several years ago, he asked the kid if he was done for the evening. Well, Jason said, no. But Fitchman said, well, you are now. Because Mal made off with the Humphrey costume, put it on, and went back on the field. Now, back then, Humphrey wasn't allowed on the field, so something was off from the get-go. Then in the eighth inning, when the Hawks had two on, and Fitchman went over to Jeff Mace, the coach who was now coaching third since Fitchman was supposed to be finished. Well, Jeff told us today Fitchman was relaying signs while wearing the costume. And when Fitchman walked over to Mace to tell him through the mesh of the Hawk head to bunt, well, everyone kind of figured it out. The next day, Fitchman was suspended for one game. And the man who suspended him, the Northwest League president, Jack Kane, who wasn't at the game in Boise that night, but rather in Bend, Oregon. But he was on his patio in Charbonneau, Oregon this afternoon. I did get a phone call about 8 o'clock the next morning from Mel Fitzman. And he said, Jack, I did something stupid last night. I said, OK, Mel, what was that? And he told me, and I laughed. I said, that is hilarious. I think that is the funniest thing in the world. But you know, the minute I hear from the umpires, I'm going to have to suspend you. And he said, oh, I know. So when he called you that, that morning, and said, I did something stupid. Did he tell you what he did that was stupid? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He told me the whole thing. He said, I got kicked out of the game. I forget what inning it was. But uh, he said, I did something stupid, put the mascot uniform on. And unfortunately, he forgot to take his baseball shoes off and his, and his stirrup, you know, the, the stirrups. And it was kind of <laughs> obvious that uh, uh, who it was, you know. So he was we, out uh, there in the Hawks mascot wearing baseball cleats and stirrups. Oh, yeah, you know, well, that's Mel, you know, but he was in a hurry. He was, he, he didn't have time to change his shoes. And so about noon that day, I got a call from the umpires. Uh, Mr. Kane, uh, the manager of the Boise Hawks did really something stupid last night, blah, 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 blah. You know, followed up then with Mel, called him back, and I said, Mel, I heard from the umpires, you're suspended. And uh, he said, oh, I knew it was going to happen. You know, you know, something he probably shouldn't have done, but it was kind of, funny at the time and I still think it's funny how many times have you told this story oh God. every time Mel Fishman's name comes up I I tell the story you know he's a, he's a bit old-time baseballer that's that's you know that's more power to him yep whatever it took to get back out there on the field yes <laughs> that's a win it. is a win I don't it doesn't matter how you got it no, it wasn't a win, actually. The Hawks apparently lost 8-4. to four. Jack Kane told us today he probably could have suspended Fitchman for more than one game, but decided his confession was worth something. We were able to track down Fitchman today. He still lives here in the Treasure Valley, but he wasn't a big fan of speaking to us about his claim to minor league fame. And, and by the way, we did find some video of this uh, in our archives down in the basement. Uh, unfortunately, it is on this antiquated uh, three-quarter inch tape, and we have no way to look at it here in the studio. And I am really excited about it because it said 629, Hawks, Salem. And it says good, good video right there. But we have no way of knowing how good that video is. And someday, hopefully, we will. But it's just it's an amazing day in Boise Hawks history. By the way, the Hawks starting back at home Saturday for a three-game homestand against the Missoula Paddleheads.
All right, just a few moments here at the end of the show. We got a question in from Jody who asks, what would happen if Raul Labrador becomes AG in terms of the abortion law? Well, that horse has already left the barn, so to speak, because he is an AG. But if he were to be, it's already a law, so his job as an attorney general would be to defend it against any case that goes that high. But it, the way it works is that anybody that was accused of an abortion or found to be ha to have an abortion, that's going to be handled on the local level. The county prosecutors would then have to deal with that as well. So not much, I guess. That election's in November, by the way.